Welcome viewers to our very timely presentation on mining and ESG trends. This forms part of our suite of video presentations for the one-to-one -one mining investment EMEA conference for online autumn 2020. I'm delighted to have Christoph Rue, who is Managing Director of Mining Metals and Indus in Industries Finance for Society General, presenting on this very key topic today. Christoph, welcome. Uh, thanks. And could you start us off with your presentation, please? Thank you very much. And thank you for having me here. Delighted to be part of that discussion. I'm just sharing my screen now. You have the usual disclaimer of, of the banks. Starting with the first slide, the first two slides will be just a high level and quick presentation of who we are, what we do. And then I'll move more precisely into the main topic of today's presentation. Uh, I'm in charge of the mining, metals and industries finance. This is part of four big sector of our natural resources group alongside energy infrastructure and trade and commodity finance. The energy infrastructure and mining industries have in common the focus on project and investment. And that's a very important part of our business. We are essentially an asset focused company, asset naturally corporate relationship, but also asset focused activity. These sectors often overlap and more particularly for mining where infrastructure can become a critical path or power generation can change not only the cost structure, but also the carbon footprint of a mine. Obviously, the three sectors have a material impact on sustain sustainable development goals, and all have an essential role to play in the implementation of the energy transition. Last but not least, our approach is that of a sector specialist active globally, where bankable projects are developed. And this sector-based, sector specialist activity is embedded in a wider corporate banking business that complements our product offering with access to other type of services. More focus on mining metals and industry. We have been active in that sector for 30 years. Our client range from miners, junior and large diversified group through industrial manufacturers, private equity firms, sovereign funds, streamers, and commodity trading firms. We cover a wide range of sectors, precious metals, base metals, the steel value chain from iron ore down to specialty steel mills, EV minerals, fertilizers, and mineral sands. And we have the ability, as I mentioned, to enhance our support to the industry with infrastructure and power generation finance expertise. We provide services further down the value chain, financing and advising on investments that have an impact on energy transition, such as the EV battery plants or the recycling. And we are a team of 40 globally active out of eight international hubs. So the key messages I wanted to pass in this presentation are essentially threefold. The first one is the importance of ESG today is real. It's a genuine transformation happening right now. It is becoming a critical investment decision criteria for most capital providers, debt or equity, investor or bank. And the financing community is increasingly willing to engage and proactive in raising the topic with corporates. The second key message is that bank and mining company are in the center of it. Both have a culture of being extensively regulated because of their potential impact. Both form part of a longer value chain upon which wider public and end product buyers are looking with the expectation 
that they act responsibly. A growing proportion, a green, sorry, a growing production of minerals is essential to the achievement of the sustainability development goals, as well as to the energy transition. And banks are essential to finance the necessary investment to supply the mineral. And the third message is that the banking market is committed to support this evolution. The standard credit process now includes the review of ESG performance. And for a mining project, an impact assessment and a remediation plan in line with equator principles. A growing share of the bank's credit portfolio is allocated towards investment or operations supporting the energy transition. And bank and capital market have developed a range of product and financing solution that link the borrowers or the issuers financing strategy with its sustainability uh, agenda. So what is the ESG revolution? I will answer that with two observations. The first one is a historical acceleration. And the second one is what we've observed in the capital market in the meantime. So let us start with the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. It is a blueprint to achieve better and more sustainable future and consists of 17 goals addressing global challenges such as poverty, inequality, climate change, environment, degradation, peace or justice. One year later, the Paris Agreement was signed, setting the goal to keep the increase of global average temperature below two degrees. Two years ago, the EU Commission released an action plan for financing sustainable growth that will have a material impact on the allocation of capital into sustainable investment. And this action plan presented 10 reforms in three areas. The first one is steering capital flows towards sustainable investment. The second one is integrating sustainability into risk assessment. And the third one is fostering transparency and sustainable corporate governance. The first two actions were the taxonomy. And the EU taxonomy, validated last year, or actually this year, is here to establish a framework to achieve a unified classification system in order to facilitate sustainable development and investment. It is an important step to allow creating a common language that investors can use everywhere when investing in projects that have a substantial positive impact on the climate and the environment. The second action is about disclosure and the Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation came in 2019. It introduced disclosure obligation for financial institution with the aims to provide more transparency on sustainability within the financial market. And lately, it is important to highlight that the EU COVID-19 recovery plan included 150 billion of green transport, clean industry and green home, green home renovation. So what, what happened in the meantime in the capital markets? If you look back a few years, the first green bond was issued in 2007. And at the end of 2019, the accumulated issuance of sustainable debt reached 1.17 trillion. PwC made a survey among European asset managers, which showed a following um, uh, evolution. First, the ESG assets represented 15% of the total European asset under management in 2019. And the firm is, in, is forecasting this share to increase to around 50% by 2025. It also highlighted that backtesting exercises demonstrated that integrating ESG into investment decision tends to provide enhanced return. And last but not least, in a survey, 77 of asked institutional investors 
plan to stop purchasing non-ESG product in 2022. This survey is about European asset management, but what is important is it is applicable to both debt and equity. And more importantly, beyond the statistical observation about ESG product penetration, it is important, and I will elaborate on that later on, that sustainability performance and rating are increasingly integrated as investment criteria in all forms from global equity to fixed income. How did the bank market adjust to this evolution? Let's start with a principle that many mining company or investors already know, uh, the equator principle. It's a framework formally launched in 2003. Um, it's a risk management framework adopted by financial institutions to determine, assess, manage environmental and social risk in a project. It is primarily intended to provide minimum standards for due diligence and monitoring. It is based on the IFC performance standard and the World Bank Group Environment Health and Safety Guidelines. Now, this framework is signed by 111 financial institutions from 37 countries. And as a result, its compliance is now a condition to access any meaningful share of the project finance market globally. This framework has evolved recently with the introduction of four new, uh, with, with, with the addition of, of, of several changes, but more in particularly three uh, important changes. The introduction of human rights and social risk. The notion of climate change assessment and the focus on biodiversity and encouragement to share data. Now, that is about project finance. More generally, banks have developed specific policies in various sectors, including mining, which are published. Some European banks have made a commitment to exit certain sectors, such as the thermal coal. 199 banks have signed the principle for responsible banking, which is designed to align the strategy to the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. And last but not least, at the COP24 Environmental Summit in Katowice, Societe Generale and four other banks agreed to develop a common methodology to measure the alignment of their lending portfolio with the objective of the 2015 Paris Agreement. The Paris Alignment Capital Transition Assessment or PACTA methodology is currently being developed by this four bank. As far as Societe Generale is concerned, we have committed to invest 100 billion into energy transition between 2016 and 2020. This objective was achieved in 2019. Subsequently, the bank has further committed to invest 120 billion from 2019 to 2023. The relationship between mining industry and sustainable development goals is particularly interesting. On the one hand, mining history, mining industry has a history of contributing to many challenges that the SDGs are trying to address. But simultaneously, and I think it's very important to highlight, the industry has the opportunity and the potential to contribute significantly to all of the 17 SDG. Naturally, mining is a very diversified industry and there are limits to any attempt to draw some general conclusion. But I think that there are three particular criteria which the, in which the impact can be particularly significant. The first one is environmental sustainability, talking about the SDG number six, clean water and sanitation, 15 life and land. Mine usually uh, need significant land and water, and both resources can be scarce. Energy access and sustainability and climate action, the SDG 7 and 13. Mining activities are energy intensive. 
and any investment toward greater efficiency, replacement of diesel by wind or solar, conversion of vehicle fleets from diesel to hydrogen fueled cell can have material impact on CO2 emission. The second, the second important one is the social inclusion. Mining affects the livelihood of local communities and the exposure of artisanal miners to fraud and human rights abuses potentially is a concern affecting neighboring mining operation regardless of the quality of their standards. Simultaneously, mines have been the sponsor of many successful development projects transforming the health, education and well-being of local communities. So we're talking about SG1 and poverty, 5 gender equality, 10 reduce equality, inequalities. And the third one is economic development. While the contribution of mining to the economy in terms of tax revenue, export revenue, employment is obvious, but what about the effect of a potential Dutch disease that could harm other vital sector of the economy of a particular country? And, and beyond the direct employ, employment and tax benefit of of, of mining, yeah, I believe that the construction by mine of transportation and energy infrastructure that can be mutualized is essential and is, is a very important development axis as it is an efficient means to draw capital in other sectors of the economy. If we focus on the climate change and the energy transition, it is now universally recognized that mining is essential to supply minerals that will make the electrification of our economy possible. The figures in the chart are coming from a report of the World Bank that assess the impact of certain minerals on certain minerals of the demand of um, coming from the electrification of the economy. And one of the strongest growth expectation in percentage term, uh, terms is on the battery metals you can see that impact on volume is very, very significant for copper and for aluminum. As such, some studies show that mining is responsible for three to 6% of greenhouse gas emission. An interesting question would be, what would be the impact of a global implementation of emission trading systems on the positioning of each individual mine along the cost curve? And even without ETS, I think we are experiencing a social tide, societal change in which the end consumer at the bottom of any product value chain now wants to understand the greenhouse gas footprint on the good that he or she purchases. And the focus on the entire value chain is a material shift, which will eventually affect the competitiveness of particular mines and for them to integrate not only scope one, but also scope two and three in their strategy. How did that affect the allocation, the availability of capital over time? Historically, banks like investors have aimed to take a very responsible approach. Some of them have some asset manager have decided to exit certain sectors. Some banks have uh, reinforced their onboarding process, including more and more criteria, including the equator principle. What has changed from this initial screening process is that the ESG factor now represents more than a screening parameter. Banks now want to engage proactively with corporates and will look at means to direct the financing to improve ESG metrics or particular projects that have a positive impact. And the focus of assessment now goes beyond the environmental, social and governance performance of company it now focuses on the contribution to the sustainable development goals. 
I think it's important to talk here about data quality because it's an important subject. And I think it has been uh, extensively commented uh, during the conference on different panels. We are in the middle of a revolution. And this revolution is relying on the contribution of a very diverse group of stakeholders, each with different backgrounds and focus. Now, there is no absolute standard of reporting, and that's a deficit, that's a challenge for many companies. And third party providers are of, of rating, sometimes show different methodology, focus on different aspects of ESG, which is a very wide topic. And that can be to some extent confusing to some mining companies. If I think about different discussion I had with the CFOs of different junior mining clients, I all very often receive two feedbacks. The first one is they didn't realize that in many respects, they are already performing or investing in line with the market expectation. Sometimes it's just lack of formal formalization or documentation of certain process. And sometimes they simply don't communicate right about it. However, the second comment I'm hearing is when it comes to reporting, they look at the methodology of several agencies and realize that these can have very different focus or approaches and they don't really know which one is the relevant one for them. On the banking side, we have developed our own expertise and scoring systems. And we've done that with the experience of transaction and situation we've seen over the years, but also in building teams of in-house experts, which are using data from multiple providers and relying on sector specific experience of client facing teams. And these client facing teams, as I said, have been visiting and financing my project for many years and are on regular dialogue with their client. At Societe Generale, we want to be very proactive. And we can also advise our client in the development of their ESG strategy. Now, this table illustrates how this evolution has now placed ESG at the heart of our internal process and product offering. I also believe that a similar evolution is true for a fast growing number of institutions, banks, or asset manager, and as I said, both in the debt as well as in the equity sector. So the first rule of the table is the historical screening process mentioned before, which is now part of onboarding process. Clients are naturally screened based on the usual KYC assessment or on usual question about beneficial owners, source of funds, organization, et cetera, but also with a particular focus on governance, composition of the board, competency, reputation of the management, policies, et cetera. Sectors or country not compliant with the bank's policy are excluded. And at this stage, the ESG strategy and performance of every client or potential client is tested against relevant benchmarks or norms, such as the equator principle, as well as our sector policies. This is a screening stage, which then leads to the next stage, which is an allocation stage, where following the screening process, we make a comparative evolution, uh, evaluation sorry, of of the business, opportunities that is proposed, and more importantly, to which extent it can contribute to higher ESG performance. This includes specific investment designed to address particular ESG issues, such as improvement of energy efficiency, replacement of generator with renewable power generation, or even construction of hydrogen production capacity to supply fleets of uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicles. And companies are compared with their peers in terms of performance and potential with an objective to focus our resource on the best performers. 
And eventually, ESG consideration form an important part of our decision process that will weigh in the final conclusion to lend as well as in the definition of the condition to a loan. These criteria are not only reviewed next to our financial analysis, but they also form part of the financial analysis of because, because ESG performance is also about operational market risk management and these risks have to be taken into account in our financial risk assessment. The third stage is about alignment of ESG strategy of our clients with our financing product offering. And this is the sustainability linked loan and green loan, which I will describe in the next slide. The table is a simplification of a stage-based process, but it reflects as well the availability of debt capital for client, which ranges from a yes or no decision at early screening, a modulation of appetite based on relative performance and contribution to SDG target, and last, an incentive to deploy more resources for financing representing an alignment with positive ESG strategy of the company. So the, the table provides, or the, the slide provides with an overview of two important products in the market, sustainability linked financing and green financing. I will also mention a third product, which may be of particular relevancy for mining sector, but for which the standards are still in preparation. is a transition bond sector. So green financing first. Green financing can be made available with green bonds on the capital market or green loans arranged by banks. Green bonds follow the green bond principle of the International Capital Market Association, the IBMA, and green loan follow the green loan principle of the London Market Association, the LMA. And both are based on four important principles. The first one is the use of proceeds. The loan is made available to finance or to refinance in full or in part a green project. It can also include the purpose can also include uh, additional expenditures such as working capital operating expenditures if they are closely related to the green assets. Then the second important parameter is the evaluation and the selection of the project. The EU green bond must follow the core components of the EU green bond standard, which outlines in the latest version four conditions which are defined in the EU taxonomy. The first one is the need to contribute substantially to one or to more of six environmental objectives. The second condition is a do, not, do no significant harm principle. They need to comply with minimal social safeguards and comply with technical screening criteria. So the first principle is use of proceeds, second is evaluation. The third principle is the management of proceeds. Well, the issuer is asked or the borrower is asked to track the amount allocated to green projects in an appropriate manner until the amount spent equals the net, received, the net proceeds uh, documented in the loan, in the financing document. And the fourth parameter is the reporting, reporting about the methodology and assumption used and the allocation of the proceeds. An important condition for the availability of this product is the mandatory verification of the framework and the allocation of proceeds by a third party, uh, such as a, a third party consultant or expert. On the other hand, the sustainably linked loan are different to the, from the green bond because they don't focus on a project there are a corporate loan made available for general corporate purposes. And these loans include an incentive for the borrower or the issuer to achieve certain key performance indicators that reflect its CSR strategy. So similar to green financing, this product is suitable for the debt capital market or for the loan market. 
one of the key parameters is the definition of the KPI, which needs to reflect the borough sector and the CSR strategy. They can rely on existing reporting process or sustainability indicator. However, they need to demonstrate sufficiently ambitious targets. So it means that they need to represent a commitment to achieve more and reach beyond what the company would have done otherwise. Once again, the condition for the bank, the objective of the bank is to contribute, to make a difference. The second of the key parameter, the second key parameter is the incentive framework for a target being made. Typically for loans, this is usually a pre-agreed reduction of the mar margin if the KPI are met, or even an increase if they are not met after a certain period of time. And the third parameter is as for the green framework, the validation by a third party expert and of the performance of uh, the agreed KPI. Why does it matter? I think both green bond and sustainably linked loan represent a very significant potential because it includes the incentive of the banks to make more capital available to sectors, to investment that contribute to the SDGs or to the energy transition. Societe Generale has recently arranged both type of financing for mining companies. So it is available for mining companies. Naturally, the challenges of the industry I referred to earlier about need to be taken into consideration in the eligibility or the assessment of the green framework. And the provision of this type of financing is conditional of the verification of the do no harm condition. However, the bank will not expect the mining company to be perfect. They will have two objectives. The first one is a client engagement. And the second one is a genuine contribution made possible by the financing. Naturally, in providing this financing, we, we do reserve the availability of this product to companies that can demonstrate that ESG forms an essential part of the corporate strategy. Moreover, our approach is bespoke for each client and the execution of these financing requires such a level of engagement with the company and such a detailed discussion about their strategy, organization, operations, that this test is de facto run several times until closing. So a few words, finally, about transition bonds. I mentioned that banks look primarily at two objectives, the engagement with the client about the ESG strategy and the contribution they can make through the provision of financing. Some companies may find it challenging to align finance flows with the precisely defined green bond use of proceeds category. However, transition financing would rely on the same principle as green bonds. So proceeds are dedicated to clearly earmarked asset or project that facilitate, facilitate sorry, or enable the issuer or the borrower climate transition. Negative externalities have to be avoided or mitigated and they are subject to a similar process of definition, transparency, monitoring, reporting, and verification as green bond. That's it for me. If you have now any question, happy to answer them. Christoph, thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that's really encouraging and interesting to see the financing uh, options available for mining companies now um, that we thought that maybe, um, you know, traditionally transition bonds wasn't something that would cover the catchment of mining companies, but um, uh, it is now. Do you see a certain type of mining company qualifying for these bonds rather than others? Is it not, it's not really down to the commodity, it's down to the sort of governance and 
meeting those criteria you met. It, it's not something where they would say, okay, um, battery and EV materials meets this narrative of a cleaner, techn technologically cleaner future. Therefore, they are um, prioritized. Or can we expect aluminium, precious metals, PGMs, for instance, all to qualify with an equal sort of stance? Uh, it's a very important question. I think the global, global impact of the company, the purpose of the company, the, the organization, uh, is, is a very important part of the ESG strategy and uh, the, the contribution that this company to the ESG um, will be assessed um, as part of a selection and, and credit and investment decision eventually. Now, it doesn't mean that a gold producer, where the link between gold production and energy transition is, for example, more distant than with lithium or with, with copper, would not have access to this type of product. And a uh, matter of fact, Société Générale recently arranged a green loan for a gold producer. What matters here is to identify, if we talk about green bond or green loan, to identify particulars particular project within the company, which are making the difference and making sure that with the provision of our financing, we make a difference in encouraging the company or making it possible for the company to achieve higher targets than initially envisaged. And to the extent that this particular investment is embedded in a wider ESG strategy, which is a very important part of the entire corporate culture and um, organization and, and strategy. Um, I think there is no reason why a gold producer or a copper producer could not access this type of financing. Absolutely. OK, excellent. Um, one question I would highlight, um, you touched on this important integration of ESG um, enhancing returns and also um, it's increasingly integrated from global equity, equity to fixed income. You know, um, the ESG narrative is, is evolving. Um, would it be fair to say that um, the cost of finance um, will come down with the better application of the SDGs, the ESG reporting standards that you've highlighted um, here as well? I wouldn't say that the cost of finance will come down. I would think that you will, or indirectly can be the consequence because more capital will be made available for project which incorporate or for companies in which ESG plays an important role. If the lenders, the equity investors, the debt investors uh, start being rigorous about the selection process and the priorities in allocations, they will obviously make more capital available to the companies which are the better performer, which make a bigger transition, bigger impact, which have um, a greater contribution. And that as such, will, by the law of competition, because there will be more capital available, reduce the cost. But I don't think that the margin or the, the fee charged for one particular loan will be immediately higher or not. There are some, um, there are some uh, evolution in the regulation where uh, in order to incentivize banks, some regulator are allowing banks to have a different regulatory, uh, regulatory capital treatment for certain investments, certain loans in such sector which have a particular impact. But I think for me, that's only a small part of the evolution uh, that may help, that may create an additional incentive. The fundamental shift is that for mining companies, like for bank, the equity investors, the shareholder of the mining companies and the banks, the debt provider of the mining company and the bank, 
except, expect their capital to be invested in projects or in corporates which make a difference in terms of ESG. So in order to comply with the expectation of the stakeholders of a bank, you will see that banks will invest more and more of their portfolio to the energy transition or to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The same way, um, it will be easier for a mining company to raise equity or to raise debt going forwards if they present themselves to the market with an impeccable ESG strategy, which is reflected across the entire culture and organization of the group. Absolutely. It's, um, it's a positive incentivization on both sides for the lender and also the, the company um, seeking finance. Um, okay, so with your view of where we're at right now then in the industry, do you feel the companies sufficiently know uh, what they need to be doing? You mentioned before about some CFOs being surprised that they actually had a great deal of data that they perhaps weren't making available or weren't telling the story about, but actually they have been doing the work already. Um, do you think this is quite common across the mid and junior tier of minor? Um, and would you, do you think there are any elements within the E, the S and the G that perhaps need more amplification from the companies? This is a good question. I, I mentioned indeed that I had several discussion with uh, uh, with, with mining companies uh, recently, and uh, the, it was a recurring theme. Um, if you just look at what the mining company do, how they operate in, in, in certain places, the impact they have in, in creating jobs, in, uh, uh, in, in financing, sponsoring projects for local communities, in developing infrastructure, these are material investments and these are material contribution to the development of the region in which they operate and to the extent that they can manage and act responsibly for the negative impact of their business and acknowledge that. I think uh, a, large, a large number of mining companies are behaving uh, absolutely in line with the expectation of the market. They just sometimes struggle to formulate that, to document that, or to communicate about it. That's one of the observations. Um, the second, observation, second answer I would give to, to your question is that I don't think that uh, governance or environmental or, or social issue are, are different uh, in different sectors of the mining industry or if a particular issue. Health and safety has been a focus of, of every mining company for a long, long period of time. There are natural improvement to be made across the board for one or the other, but essentially it's part of the culture of mining to operate safely. Um, the impact on uh, the cooperation with local community and the, the creation of opportunity and development of the economy is also part of their culture. I think formulating that, uh, um, documenting that accordingly, embedding that in the policies and the governance in a, in, in a way may be, uh, may be very helpful. Um, there is, however, one potentially one uh, situation where I could think that it's more difficult for one or for the others. Um, this requires this will work and, and, and resources to be invested in in, in, in documentation, communication, etc., And uh, it is true that junior mining companies do not have the resources that large diversified producers have. And uh, it is more costly, uh, relatively speaking, for uh, one single asset uh, greenfield um, uh, company to have an ESG team uh, than uh, for a, a larger diversified uh, producer. That's, that's an obvious statement. It doesn't mean they cannot do that. And uh, uh, it's just a matter of, of priority, I believe. Um, and uh, we are here to help as well. Bank also provide a lot of advice in that respect. Yep, certainly. Um, it seems that um, it's very much a journey that is accelerating um, and, and um, it's very much a partnership relationship um, in terms of getting companies to, to meet these criteria, secure finance, and, um, and move towards the greater um, sus um, sustainable development goals. 
um, that will help them um, continue this journey. Um, okay, well, Christoph, that's great. Thank you very much for presenting to us on uh, ESG and financing trends. Um, that's really gonna complement um, some of the narratives that we've had through the conference so far. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.